Art. Okay, and now we're live. Good morning, everyone. Thank you once again for joining the Washington Kurdish Institute uh, via Zoom at this upcoming panel discussion about the future movement uh, of the Kurdish, the Kurdish future movement in the, the in, in Turkey. Uh, we're privileged and honored to have our, our distinguished speakers with us, including the president of the Washington Kurdish Institute, the WKI, Dr. Najmad Bin Karim, uh, without his uh, uh, lifelong uh, dedication to the Kurdish cause and leadership, we would not be here. So we appreciate him being with us. We also have two renowned uh, figures in the think tank world together at the same panel, which makes us very proud to have them both together here with us. And that's one, Dr. Henry Barkey, uh, the senior fellow uh, at the uh, Council on Foreign Relations, the CFR. He focuses on the strategic future of the courts in the Middle East. Uh, he also has worked at the Wilson Center and the Carnegie. Uh, he's been following the Kurdish issue for the decades. Uh, he also was a, a, a US government official in the Department of State in the 90s. Uh, we're thank, thanking you, doctor, for joining us. Uh, the other figure is uh, Dr. David Pollack, the senior fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, WINAP. Uh, he's also the founder and the director of Project Fikra, uh, a great platform that contributes uh, on, the, on the political, security, economic issues, especially in Middle East. I highly encourage you to visit uh, WashingtonInstitute.com slash Fikra Forum. Uh, he also has uh, devoted uh, his life in the uh, following, observing the political events, especially in Middle East and, and Kurdistan. He knows the Kurdish leaderships and the parties and the Kurdish internal affairs. We welcome you, sir, and thank you for accepting this invitation. Uh, finally, we have with us uh, Giran Ozjan, the representative of the People's Democratic Party, HDP, to United States. He's a rising star with the HDP, within the HDP. Uh, prior to joining the HDP office in October of 2017, he worked in the UK, as a civilian activist, he has great knowledge of public relations and media. And despite a lot of attacks from the pro-Turkish government on the social media, he continues to focus on his job and we welcome him uh, at this uh, panel with us. Uh, we will, uh, after opening remarks by our guests, we will take Q&A and uh, we ask you to be brief about your questions, please, so we can take as many as we can. Uh, without further ado, uh, Dr. Najmadeen, please start the session. Thank you, Yusuf, and thank you for organizing this uh, seminar. And uh, it's great to be with uh, good friends uh, on the panel. Uh, and I look forward to hearing from all of you. Uh, I probably should stop here and just let you talk because everybody's uh, so much experienced uh, about what's going on in Turkey. But I'll make my remarks brief. Uh, uh, I'm sure in the last few days uh, uh, you have been following the news of Turkish attacks in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, in different places actually, uh, in Khorkurk, in Mahmur, in Shingar, uh, in uh, a lot of those places. Uh, as you know, Mahmur is a refugee camp. More than 10,000 people live there, uh, women, children, uh, elderly people. Uh, and yet uh, Turkey repeatedly attacks that place based on the fact that, uh, on the non-fact actually, that uh, these are harboring uh, terrorists and trading uh, terrorists. Uh, and if we look at this, this is not the first time that Turkey is doing this. They have done it many times before, and they claim that they will uh, uh, crush the Kurdish uh, resistance uh, and get rid of so-called uh, terrorists now I think uh, these terrorists are uh, uh, coordinating with Antifa uh, in the United States. You, you heard all that joke from uh, Erdogan, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, our president uh, uh, takes it uh, uh, as a joke, not as uh, he did uh, in 2019 when he got the phone call and uh, uh, allowed the Turkish incursion into uh, northern Syria. What we see in Turkey now is uh, really a, a hegemony uh, in multiple uh, uh, fronts uh, in the Aegean, 
uh, in Libya, in Iraqi Kurdistan. Of course, they are still occupying Cyprus since 1974. And that's what they will do wherever they go, whether it's Libya or Kurdistan or uh, any other place. Uh, today, we look at the situation in Turkey itself, and we see uh, that out of the 65 uh, mayors who have been elected uh, uh, with the significant vote of the local population in different municipalities uh, of those, uh, about 50 of them are uh, dismissed and uh, uh, other people have been appointed uh, by Erdogan for those. Uh, of those, more than 20 of them actually are in prison. Uh, in addition to uh, the many parliamentarians whom uh, I personally know many of them, and uh, they are residing in jail. Uh, and this is really the, the result of the short-sighted policy of the uh, CHP as well, when they allowed the Turkish parliament and they voted for lifting immunity on the parliamentarians. Uh, and now they are reaping the benefit of that uh, vote themselves. Uh, and uh, I think the, uh, the, the march from uh, Ederna and from uh, Hakkari has started towards Ankara, despite all the pressure from uh, Turkey. The Kurds are not the only victims of Erdogan and, uh, uh, and his regime, uh, but the entire Turkish uh, people, uh, the Alawis, the Kurds, the Yazidis, uh, everyone, uh, the press, we know many, uh, how the press, what pressure the press is under, uh, and they're still arresting people, tens, sometimes hundreds, uh, under the guise of that uh, they were involved with the Gulen movement. And just a few days ago, some of this happened uh, in Turkey. Uh, I think here we, the, the dilemma is uh, Europe, NATO, and United States. They have been supportive of these oppressive, oppressive non-democratic uh, measures that are going in Turkey, hoping that something, when they Erdogan disappears, and somebody else will come back uh, uh, to Turkey and uh, the old relationship uh, starts again. But the old relationship itself was, uh, was uh, wrong with regard to democracy, especially with regard to, uh, to the people of Kurdistan in Turkey. Uh, this has been going on under uh, the previous regimes, even pre-Erdogan. And uh, uh, this is... A, Erdogan's regime is an example of authoritarian uh, regimes that comes uh, to power with democracy, and then they start uh, trampling on the freedom of press, freedom of religion, uh, freedom of expression. Uh, and Turkey is really an authoritarian uh, system now. And I think uh, uh, our policy as United States government is on the wrong side of history, and it encourages uh, oppression, uh, and that's why during one of these seminars I called for uh, United States uh, to work with the European allies and with NATO members. Uh, and the first thing, the first step in that will be, in my opinion, is to uh, lifting this terrorist label on PKK. That way they could exert more pressure on PKK, but on that, at the same time, uh, work with Turkey and exert pressure on them because the only solution to the Kurdish problem, which extends actually not only in Turkey, but also to Iraqi Kurdistan and, uh, and to uh, Syria or Northeastern Syria administration, is if this label is lifted, uh, because Erdogan considers everybody a terrorist who calls for the rights of the people, not just Kurds, even Turks, right of press, right of free speech. Uh, I think doing that, uh, will be a good step and the first step towards resolving the Kurdish issue. It will be good for Turkey, it will be good for the countries in the region. And we saw how the uh, United States did that with uh, Mujahideen Khalq. Mujahideen Khalq were uh, involved in uh, killing Americans in, uh, uh, in Iran uh, before the uh, overthrow of the Shah. They did it in uh, uh, Kuwait, uh, whereas the PKK has never attacked uh, any American uh, individual or American force or American base anywhere 
uh, throughout their history. Uh, I don't pretend to say that everything PKK does is uh, kosher and there's nothing wrong with it. There are a lot of things that uh, could be improved from the PKK side as well. Uh, but, but going that way, working on that, I think will be an important step. I will stop here and uh, look forward to listening to your remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karim. We appreciate your remarks. Uh, and then Dr. Barkey. Uh, thank you, Yusuf. Thank you for organizing this. I just wanted to make one little correction. You did not mention my real affiliation, which is Lehigh University. They pay my salary and nobody else does, so I should mention them. Um, let me, I, I want to start by essentially juxtaposing Erdogan of today and Erdogan of some years ago. Erdogan, a few years ago, is the one who started a peace process. He's the one who had the Turkish state officially negotiate with Öcalan, the infamous terrorists. And it was a period of great opening. It was a period of um, relaxation, especially in, in the uh, Kurdish majority areas. You could see people put up signs in, in both languages, in Turkish and Kurdish. Um, and there was an enormous amount of optimism that for the first time in Turkish history that there was going to be some movement towards an accommodation. And, but suddenly all of this collapsed. And the question is, why did it collapse? That, I mean, essentially there are two explanations and, in, and they are both valid at the same time. They're not um, uh, opposites of each other. The first is the easy one and the one that also fits to, to explain Edwin's behavior today is that he was essentially driven by domestic political cons um, requirements. He thought this was a way to improve his standing and in fact he would have gone into history books as essentially as a peacemaker. So in terms of his own image and as well as his own uh, Turkey's future, he had essentially situated himself um, right where he should be at the time. But he changed. And the reason he changed uh, is because of two, two developments. One is the emergence of the PYD um, in, in Syria that ultimately in 2014 started to get help from the United States formally in, in a fight against ISIS. And for the first time, you had the United States get involved in the Syrian civil war. Not only that, it was getting involved with the Syrian Kurds. And if you look at it from a historical perspective and a Turkish perspective, it goes back essentially to the creation of the KRG. Again, if the KRG is in existence today, the Kurdistan regional government in Iraq, it is because the United States intervened sometimes late, but nonetheless it intervened and essentially was a midwife to the creation of a federal Iraqi state where the KRG has a special status. Now, that model is one uh, in which the, the Turks are afraid the United States will do again in Syria because here you have an unpopular leader in Syria, just like you had an unpopular leader in, in Iraq. Iraq was, uh, and Syria were both uh, in the throes of domestic uh, political problems. The Turks, to their credit, because uh, to their credit, essentially did make an accommodation with the KRG, and the KRG and, and the Turkish government, as we can see today too, have, have had very good relations. But, but the difference is that from, a, from Ankara's perspective, you may, be you may tolerate one Kurdish federal state or one Kurdish autonomous region, but you can't, you can't do two. You cannot tolerate two. If the Syrian Kurds were also to get uh, a, an autonomous region in, in Syria after the, the end of the civil war and Assad's departure, then it, again, it will be the Americans who will be creating this. So, to, and given the conspiracy theories in Turkey about how America is trying to divide Turkey, this all fits into this notion that the United States is out there to destroy Turkey, to divide Turkey, to create, to create a Kurdish state. And to some extent, from my Erdogan's perspective, the American action in Syria, in 
with the PYD, which of course the PYD is also an, a, an offshoot of the PKK. I mean, it's, in that sense, it's different than the KRG, um, was a strategic threat for Turkey. And that is essentially, is really the reason why Erdogan made a complete turnabout. But he, since then, he's gone much further. I mean, he's gone much further in his, and the others will speak to, to this in the sense that now there's an attempt to completely destroy any type of Turk Kurdish political activity. I mean, you see the HDP's leaders are in jail. The Mirtash has been in jail now for three years. And the idea that the second largest political party in Turkey, I'm sorry, the third largest political party in Turkey, the second largest opposition party in Turkey, um, leader is in jail is, is, is really totally unacceptable uh, from a political perspective. But he is now, he has now decided to eliminate the HDP. I and mean, they are, they, you've seen now uh, there's a campaign to close down the HDP. And, he, and this will probably happen only because Erdogan is increasingly uh, losing confidence among the Turkish population. And therefore, he, he's already in a coalition government. But if there are new elections, he would like to come to power without any other coalition partner. And the only way that can, achieve, that can happen is if the HDP is eliminated from the political calculus. And so that's, that's the goal now. Again, so it's, it's a combination of strategic reasons and, and domestic political reasons. The, only, the last point I was, I'm gonna make is politics is not li linear, right? So for many, many years, for decades or a century, we've seen Kurdish rebellions in Turkey and at every, at every turn, uh, the Kurds have come back, they've adapted to, to conditions and they have come up with different ways of struggling. The Kurdish problem is here, it's not gonna go away. Whatever Turkey does, it's, it's gonna be here 10 years from now, 30, 50 years from now, if the Turks don't, don't, don't deal with it. And I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Baki. Uh, I'm sure there will be questions about that. Uh, and uh, I would like uh, for you, Dr. Polak, if you could please start. Yes. Thanks very much uh, to all of you, to the Washington Kurdish Institute, to our participants, and to our, my fellow panelists, whom I hold in great esteem. And following Henri Barkey's lead, I also want to thank uh, the people who pay my salary, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, who enable me to continue to do research, to travel, uh, several times a year to Kurdistan um, and to Turkey and to other parts of the region in order to pursue this work. Although, of course, because of the coronavirus, uh, I haven't been able to do that since March, but okay, I'm waiting for the next opportunity. So um, let me just make a few very brief comments because I would like to leave as much time as possible for your questions and discussion. And uh, I very much appreciate the um, remarks by Professor Barkey about how Erdogan was once, and it's only five years ago, the champion actually of reconciliation with the Kurds, both inside Turkey and inside Syria. Not to mention, of course, the longstanding good relations between Erdogan's government and the KRG, the Kurdistan Regional Government across the border in Iraq. Uh, and I think that raises the question, in, or should raise the question in my mind and in all of our minds, well, if he changed once in what I would call a negative direction, of course, toward the Kurds, uh, both in Syria, inside Turkey, and to some extent, even in Iraq, if he changed once in a negative direction, is it possible that Erdogan could change again, in this time perhaps going back into a more positive direction on all of these issues. And I had an opportunity, to my own amazement, to put that question in person to President, at the time Prime Minister Erdogan himself, in October of 2017. Uh, and I would like to just relate for what it's worth, what he told me. It was, to me, rather shocking at the time, but I think it has held up for the last two and a half years, and I don't imagine that this is going to change in the future. And this is what he said. I asked him, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, what is your long-term vision for the future 
of the Kurdish citizens of Turkey. And he gave a very long answer in very calm tones, but with great, I would say, uh, menace uh, behind his calm voice. And he said, as far as the future of Turkish citizens of Kurdish descent, he wouldn't use the word Kurds, uh, as far as the future of Turkish citizens of Kurdish descent, Erdogan told me, quote, the days of dialogue are over, unquote. That was in October of 2017. And uh, and then he went on to say, from now on, the leading party for the Turkish citizens of Kurdish descent will be my party, the AKP. Not the HDP, not any other party, not an opposition party, not even an ally of Erdogan and his party, but just his party, my way or the highway, as we say in America. And I believe that he meant every word of what he said and the record of the last two and a half years since then suggests that he has, if anything, only hardened his position even further on these questions. And that the prospect that he will change in a more positive direction and resume some form of peace talks with the HDP or even with Abdullah Ocalan, uh, as he once did only five years ago, or that he will accept reconciliation with the Syrian Kurds, and especially, of course, with the PYD. The, the prospect of any of those changes in the future is extremely remote as close to impossible as anything ever is in politics, I think, for Erdogan. And I see this as, unfortunately, a kind of a vicious circle in which his declining popularity among the Turkish population in general only makes him dig in even harder against what he sees as his enemies at home and abroad and makes him even more desperate to hang on to the support of the ultra-nationalist MHP party that, if anything, is even more anti-Kurdish than the AKP and Erdogan personally. And to eke out every, as one of my good colleagues at the Washington Institute Center, Chapta, said, to eke out every drop, every extra percent of ultra-nationalist Turkish ethnic chauvinist support that he possibly can inside his country or outside, which unfortunately means a policy that is basically anti-Kurdish. And he has rejected in recent months and weeks, for example, even the American efforts to find a way to as some American officials put it, to dilute the influence of the PYD among the Syrian Kurds by merging them with other Kurdish parties inside Syria so that they would be more acceptable to Turkey as a potential partner. Erdogan and his government have rejected even that. And so I see this as uh, an extremely difficult probably an insurmountable obstacle to any reconciliation and any further progress on this issue. Now that brings me to the second quick point that I want to make, and that is, okay, so what is the attitude of the U.S. government and of American officials toward this increasingly intransigent Turkish government line on Kurdish issues? And I would say based on very recent conversations that I've had with very senior U.S. government officials, I would just say the following. First of all, U.S. government officials believe that Erdogan and his party actually have a significant amount of popular support among the Kurds inside Turkey. That there are many, as U.S. government officials put it, quote unquote, conservative 
Kurdish voters inside Turkey who are supporters, maybe reluctant supporters, but supporters of the AKP and who go along with this hardline Turkish government policy toward their own ethnic group. And that a significant segment of other Kurds inside Turkey, if not supporting the AKP and Erdogan, are reluctant to get involved in anti-government policies or parties or protests, and basically want to integrate or assimilate or whatever you want to call it, just lay low, keep a low profile and stay out of trouble and avoid raising the Kurdish issue or any other opposition issue to the Turkish government, just you might say for their own safety and peace of mind in this very oppressive climate that they face. And it's only about, again, according to informal, but I think uh, important US government estimates, it's only about a third of the Kurds, even inside Turkey, who were actively opposed to the AKP and who were, can be counted on to support the HDP or other expressions of Kurdish political rights in that country. And the result is that based on, in part, I think, on that estimate, along, of course, with Turkey's geopolitical importance in the region and beyond the region, in NATO and so on, based on that analysis, I have to say, much as I respect uh, other opinions and Dr. Najmuddin's proposals, I don't see any prospect that the US government will change its position on the PKK or intervene in any active way on the Kurdish question inside Turkey. And that leads me to one final point that I want to make, uh, which is Turkish policy in the region as a whole, not just toward the Kurds in its borders or across its borders in Syria and Iraq, but more broadly in the region. Turkey is adopting an extremely activist and interventionist foreign policy, including in the military sphere in a way that we haven't seen since late Ottoman times. And going as far afield across the Mediterranean as Libya and uh, on into the Red Sea and the Horn of Africa and the Gulf and, uh, and so on. And uh, in some ways, that policy is, I think, uh, leading Turkey into a dead end and a quagmire as it has in Syria. But in other ways, I think Turkey has seen at least enough of a measure of apparent short-term success at a low enough cost to convince Erdogan that this is actually benefiting him politically and maybe benefiting Turkey strategically and economically. And the opposition to these Turkish moves in the region or beyond from the United States or Europe or other powers is very weak. In fact, the tendency increasingly in recent months is for these outside powers, including the US government, to accept a large measure of this Turkish intervention, or military intervention outside, far outside its borders, whether in Libya or in Syria, or even now in coordination, as I understand it, in just the last few days with Iran against uh, certain parts of Iraqi Kurdistan on, in the tri-border areas and elsewhere. And I don't think that in the long run, this actually serves the best interests of the US, of NATO, or even of Turkey itself. But in, for the foreseeable future, I see that Erdogan is determined to pursue what he sees as a moment of relative advantage for Turkey against the Kurds and against other opponents, real and imagined, everywhere around the region. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Polak. Um, Giran, please. Um, I want to also thank the Washington Kurdish Institute for organizing this panel and giving us an opportunity to, to express what's going on in Turkey right now, especially in this uh, tough time. Um, but I do want to start off uh, with making a distinction uh, 
uh, between the way the Turkish state has historically approached the Kurdish question and the way the AKP government led by Erdogan is approaching it now. Um, and I think that the distinction here that needs to be made is that the Turkish state inherently and historically has uh, an inherent animosity towards the Kurds and the Kurdish existence in the region. Uh, and this is grounded on the way the Turkish nation state and the Republic of Turkey was founded um, in, in, a, in an area where you have millions of Kurds, you had Armenians, um, and uh, the way the Turkish Republic was founded has left it with a very inherent um, a, an animosity, but also uh, an, an insecurity when it comes to other ethnicities and especially uh, the Kurdish uh, ethnicity and existence in the region. And what we've already established with uh, both Professor Baki and Dr. Pollock was that Erdogan's and the current AKP government's approach to the Kurdish issue is much more pragmatic and much more connected to the, uh, the you know, his own political domestic health. Um, and so when, when people in the Turkish uh, state uh, talk about the Kurds as an existential threat, uh, I think uh, the Turkish state bureaucracy and people that have come from the Kemalist ideology mean something else, and the current AKP government and Erdogan means something completely different. Whereas the Turkish state um, officials and elites of the past, and who are now ever present today as well, uh, they mean a threat to the whole idea of the Turkish nation state. Whereas Erdogan uh, means a threat to his own hold on authoritarian power in Turkey. Um, and so, when we draw this distinction, I think, especially at this time, when we see this tension between the, the, your, you know, your, the old guard of the Turkish state, which, uh, you know, the very elites possessed by the Kemalist ideology that the Turkish nation state was founded on, and the current AKP government, the tension is becoming even more visible. And I know as the HDP rep, I'm, I may be uh, tasked with talking about the difficulties that the HDP is facing, but I also want to give a little a few minutes to the difficulties that the Turkish state is facing right now. And as we watch uh, this unfold, the, the, the clash between the AKP elite, which has tried to embed itself in the Turkish state structure for the past almost 20 years, and the resisting old guard, the, the resisting old guard of the Kemalist bureaucracy and the security structure. Right now, uh, I don't want to turn this into a history uh, seminar, but right now we see the the people that represent the old Kemalist guard and the current AKP government are in a very tense partnership. And I think this plays out in parliament and in government right now uh, with the AKP MHP alliance, but also uh, when we saw with how the AKP partnered with the Gulen movement, how they defanged the Kemalist old guard, the Kemalist bureaucracy, and how Erdogan, after splitting with the Gulenist movement had actually revitalized the people that he put in prison, that he helped put in prison in 2010, 2011 with the Ergena Contras. And I think what we as the Kurds, and I actually mentioned in an interview the other day that right now the Kurds are facing the most comprehensive attack by the Turkish state ever. Because right now, uh, although the Turkish state has bombed uh, and massacred Kurds throughout its history. Although Kurdish members of parliament and mayors have been arrested before, we now have a Turkish state that can bomb Kurds in three different countries, in Turkey, in Syria, and Iraq, all the while domestically still imprisoning Kurdish elected officials. Um, so, you know, I don't want to make comparisons, comparisons between which Turkish governments were better to the Kurds whenever, but uh, what we know today is that Erdogan, with his uh, political, domestic political health in mind, has partnered with a Turkish state that has inherently had this animosity towards the Kurds. And this uh, has been a recipe of disaster for the Kurdish people living all over the area. Now, I, I, if we come to talk about the prospects for the Kurdish movement, um, I think uh, while the attack of the Turkish state and the current Turkish government has been very comprehensive, I actually don't think the Kurds 
have been have ever been better placed to counter these uh, attacks in all parts of both Kurdistan and inside Turkey as well. For example, when the Turkish state in the 90s and 80s uh, was still very uh, you know, hostile towards the Kurdish movement, the Kurdish political party, the predecessors of the HDP, had never crossed the 10% threshold and weren't uh, legitimate political actors that could have any impact on Turkish parliamentary politics. But right now, inside Turkey domestically, for the first time, the Kurds uh, are represented by a party that can cross the anti-democratic 10% threshold, that can play a major role in who gets to govern Turkey today. We saw this with the most recent local elections. The Kurds, electorally speaking in Turkey, have never been as powerful as they are today, in spite of all of the crackdown that we see across the board. Additionally, in Syria, the Kurds have now uh, proven themselves to be a very significant actor in not only the future of Assad, but the future of how a future Syria might look like. And already we see that the Turkish state, again, the partnership between the Kemalist Turkish security structure and the current AKP government who sees uh, polarization and uh, an increasing nationalism in Turkey as uh, imperative for its own political health. Uh, we see this combination playing out in Syria in uh, attacks against Afrin, Sariq Ghani, um, even in 2017, when Erdogan literally threatened uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, southern Kurdistan with starvation when uh, they declared their independence referendum. I, I, maybe just to sum up, uh, I really need to say this because I think that when we start talking about these issues more comprehensively and as, as the Kurds become recognized all over the world, as the Kurds become an integral part uh, for any kind of uh, power politics in the region, especially now going forward into the future, I think this is going to be even more visible. Uh, we need to talk about the Turkish state um, and what the Turkish state means in general. I know a lot of the talk is about Erdogan, but I do actually think that we need to transcend that a little bit because I think uh, if we continually talk about Erdogan all the time, we actually empower him more than he actually is in Turkey right now. I don't think he's calling all the shots. Um, and that's why we do need to talk about the Turkish state's inherent animosity and hostility towards the Kurdish phenomenon across the whole region. Uh, because I know the Turkish government and its mouthpieces like to say that this is a PKK issue or this is a security issue. This is definitely not that. This is um, a DNA issue for the Turkish state. Um, and I think uh, as we people, or the people that want to talk about the Kurdish issue in the region, people that want to see what kind of a Middle East can actually be structured going forward, I think we do definitely need to talk about um, the Turkish state as an organism that can and should change. Uh, because we as the HDP uh, do not define ourselves as a Kurdish nationalist party. We are a party that believe in uh, the shared and joint future of all the peoples of Turkey on a dignified basis for every single ethnicity living in Turkey. Um, and that's why I think right now we're seen as even more of a threat than what we were before. Um, I know a lot of Kurdish nationalists in the region like to say that with the HDP, it, the way it articulates uh, Kurdish freedom, may, uh, a lot of Kurdish nationalists criticize the HDP for, for not uh, looking after the Kurdish demand. But I think uh, for us Kurds, especially inside Turkey, we need to be sensitive uh, of all the peoples of our country, because our destinies are definitely tied together. Um, and as we see, as I, say, as I said earlier, the current AKP government and the Turkish state bureaucracy have partnered uh, in their hostility towards the Kurds. One, for conjunctural pragmatic reasons. The other, unfortunately, for more historical reasons. And this partnership, in every which way possible, needs to be overcome. And I think uh, this was the underlying reason in, in why we supported Eklem Imamoğlu, for example, in places like Istanbul, because they came out 
with at least a different articulation um, and a different kind of politics. And hopefully, as Dr. Kerim said as well, because the CHP is definitely part of the problem too, and hopefully they can actually transform their uh, political identity and be a force for good in, in solving a lot of the issues we have in Turkey, the Kurdish question being the most important. Thank you, Giran. Um, thank you very much for that. Uh, um, Dr. Barki, um, Giran ended up his remarks about the CHP and hoping for better approach toward the Kurds, but uh, the Turkish opposition overall, even the new foreign party like AE and others, they still are not including the HDP within their uh, group of opposition. Um, Imam Oğlu that won with the Kurdish votes also supported the Turkish invasion into the Syrian Kurdish region. Uh, how do you, can you talk about the Turkish opposition's approach and is it, is it time for the HDP to change its core to become more uh, focusing on the Kurdish issue than democratization of Turkey? You mean whether the CHP should change or? Overall, the opposition of Turkey or HDP too, changing its core since it's not working in this democratization well, of let, me, let me start with HTP. I mean, HTP's strategy until recently was actually quite successful. And you can argue that even though it is under enormous amount of pressure now, it still is, has, is fairly strong and fairly, fairly cohesive uh, as, as a party. And I don't see why they necessarily need to change policy. The problem in Turkey today is that if you are not, uh, accepted by the Turkish government, you can't be on television. I mean, there's big, there's big uh, on, on social media, there's a big con controversy today about a, a, me, a television debate yesterday about the HTP where no HTP person was, was invited. And when, when somebody said, said that, the, the moderator took umbrage uh, and said, we are an independent channel, we can do whatever we want. But, but the truth is, it's very, very clear that you cannot express and talk about these issues. So, so in terms of the political space, there is really not much room. The AKP essentially dominates it. And even CHP doesn't have a chance to, to express. But CHP is in many ways what Giran talked about. It is a core of the Turkish state. The CHP is, is created the, the Turkish state. And in that sense, many of its elements still contain that animosity towards the Kurdish towards the Kurds that, um, that Giran, Giran mentioned. Yes, there are elements within the CHP that are, that are um, more moderate, that would like to, to open up to, to HTP, create a, a joint opposition, but they're all afraid by, because of this very arch nationalist wave that uh, Erdogan has unle unleashed. And in fact, if you look at the other two parties, the MHP and the Good Party, E Party, they all are incredibly anti 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 Kurdish. So there isn't at the moment much space. What what will happen, however, is that I don't think that Erdogan will be successful either in terms of the foreign adventures that uh, David was uh, talking about, or domestically in terms of the pandemic and economic uh, economic problems. So there will be a shift against, against Erdogan at some point uh, that it will be sufficient and significant enough that it will force to open up the public space. And at that point, we will see whether or not the CHP will have the courage to, 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 to come up with a, with a new policy. At the moment, it's hopeless. Thank you, Dr. Barkey. Um, a question I can ask both Dr. Karim and Giran. Uh, the HDP, as you explained, has the democratization of Turkey first policy. But there's an argument that even in democratic states like Spain and the United Kingdoms, the national right of minorities like the Catalans and the Scottish have not been resolved. Uh, what makes you think that the Turkish democracy, if uh, it comes ever to exist, would solve the Kurdish issue? Dr. Karim? Well, uh, there's a little bit difference between Spain and, uh, and England. Actually, England allowed uh, Scotland to go through the referendum and uh, uh, people did not vote for independence. That may come back, actually. There's talk about it being redone again. Uh, 
in uh, in Spain, it was similar to uh, really what we had in Kurdistan in 2017. You had the EU, all the EU countries were uh, would not accept it. Spain itself, within the in the constitution, there's something that wouldn't allow it. Just like the government of Iraq that stood against uh, the referendum in Kurdistan, and even though the referendum was uh, basically not declaration of independence, it's for the people to vote and then get into dialogue with the Baghdad government uh, to resolve the outstanding issues based on the constitution. And if that had come, then probably the referendum would have been, uh, you know, the independence would have been shelved as long as uh, the, the constitution was implemented. But unfortunately, uh, the Iraqi government uh, took advantage of the situation uh, and uh, the Shia militias and of course Kurdish collab part, part of Kurdish collaboration with the government led to that. Uh, I think the mentality both in Spain and in Iraq uh, has not changed with regard to Kurdish aspirations. Uh, the same applies I think to Turkey and I think Goran went into detail about that. I just like to make a po one point about uh, the uh, Erdogan's policy like five years ago, how it was in the negotiations. We just have to remember when the Dolmabahce agreement was uh, declared with the, between the, uh, with the interior minister of Turkey and I think it was uh, uh, Suri Surya, uh, the HDP representative. This was in February. Erdogan in March came out that says, this is null and void. This is before there was any uh, movement in, uh, uh, you know, building trenches and other things uh, in Diyarbakir in some other cities uh, of uh, uh, Turkey's Kurdistan. Uh, so Erdogan really had never had the intention of resolving uh, the Kurdish issue. Uh, and I think that uh, both uh, uh, Henri and David alluded to the fact that it's what's good for Erdogan, it's what's good for Turkey. And that's what the bottom line is. He uses people, he uses communities. He did that with the Gulen movement. Uh, Guran mentioned how he uh, imprisoned all the uh, military people, the Kamalists, and then he got them out and now he is using them actually against the Kurds, whether it's in Syria, in Iraq, or in Turkey itself. Thank you, Dr. Karim. Uh, Guran? Um, so let me just say this. I don't think the um, democracy will necessarily or will definitely solve the Kurdish issue. But I do know the, uh, uh, you know, we can't solve, you know, almost definitely that we can't solve the Kurdish issue without democracy. Um, and so that's why, you know, we as the HDP feel the need to invest in trying to democratize Turkey in order to solve the Kurdish issue. Now, there are other political entities uh, and organizations that feel that they need to take up arms to do this, for example, the PKK. But we as a political party uh, see our mission as trying to democratize Turkey as much as possible uh, in the process solving a lot of the problems that uh, Turkey as a country faces, but also seeing how we can uh, broaden the space for Kurds to be able to articulate their demands through legitimate politics inside Turkey. Um, and I, I think the, you know, you have to separate uh, different avenues uh, and that's why uh, I don't think democracy itself uh, will automatically solve the Kurdish issue uh, but I think the underlying thing for me is that uh, without democracy it's just much much more difficult. Thank you. Uh, David, at the National Press Club during the Avrin invasion, uh, you, we hosted you and you spoke very directly and generous, generous, generously about uh, for the Kurds, you told the Kurds not to corner the United States or make United States to choose between the Kurds and Turkey because at the end they will choose Turkey. But Erdogan has also closed all the doors on the Kurds. And uh, the Kurds are still willing, as you hear from Giran, to have a peace negotiation once again. Uh, what can the Kurds do to win the West support, the United States support, or even the regional support from others? 
for the question. Um, and I uh, would have to say that I don't have an answer. Um, I, I, I mean, honestly, it's, it's, uh, I do think that um, the Kurds in Syria and the Kurds in Iraq can continue to count on American support uh, up to a point, certainly not to the point of independence or Iraqi Kurdistan, and not to the point of full regional autonomy in Syrian Kurdistan, but at least to the point of some protection for their local self-government and their physical safety um, from the United States. However, for the Kurds in Turkey, or for that matter, in Iran, uh, which we haven't really talked about, I am sorry to have to say that I don't see the US government willing to take much, if any, action in order to advance their agenda or protect their basic human and political rights. And I, I know that the US government behind the scenes would certainly like to see the Turkish government move back toward greater democracy, including for the Kurdish citizens of Turkey. But uh, this is not, as I see it, at the top of the list of American priorities regarding US-Turkish relations, nor is it at high on the list of American priorities regarding what's going on with Iran and the confrontation between the United States and Iran. So those are, of course, uh, the two largest uh, populations of Kurds in the region or in the world, in Turkey and in Iran. And I'm sorry to have to say that they are, uh, for the US government, for geopolitical reasons, not because we don't like or sympathize with or appreciate the Kurds, on the contrary. Um, I think as a country and as a people and as a government, we do. But because other priorities are higher on the list for larger regional and global geopolitical concerns, uh, the United States is probably going to continue basically to turn a blind eye. Thank you, Dr. Polak. I will open the mic for uh, Peter Galbert to join. He has a question. He's been having his hand raised for a while. Um, so let me just... Peter. Yes, yes. hi. hi. Um, um, so, first, I, I want to say how uh, much I appreciate this panel and the work of the Washington Kurdish Institute and uh, particularly Dr. Najmuddin Karim, who uh, created this and um, who's uh, uh, really been a source of education on things Kurdish, I think, for all of us, for me, for more than 30 years. Um, my question is, uh, let's assume that the polls in the United States are correct uh, about the upcoming American election and that they translate into that the popular vote translates into a uh, electoral vote uh, result. Uh, what should the next US president do about Turkey? Uh, what, did, what changes should he make? And secondly, uh, do you see a danger that Trump having lost will, do, will feel liberated to, to do uh, undesirable things, particularly in Syria, but perhaps elsewhere, and what dangers would you see in that? Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Dr. Henry, Dr. Barkey, could you? Well, look, there are a number of issues uh, between the United States and Turkey regarding, for example, the, the purchase of S-400 missiles, the issue of the Eastern Mediterranean, increasingly the tensions between Greece and Turkey in the Aegean. And of course, there's, there's a bit, so there are a number, and then of course there's the issue of Halkbank where 
uh, the Treasury is, is technically supposed to impose a large fine on a Turkish state on, on bank. So there are a number of issues over which the Turks, Turkey and United States are at odds, but at the moment Turkey is being protected by, by President Trump. On the, on, on the Hill, there is much more animosity toward, towards Turkey. The decision of Trump to allow the Turks to invade Syria was roundly condemned. We, we saw General Mattis resign, resign over this. So I expect that a Biden administration will be tougher on, on Turkey and will try to push back on, on these issues. And to the extent that if, if their analysis is the same as mine is, and that is that um, Erdogan gets away because nobody at the end of the day has, shall we say, the, the courage or the willingness to say to him, no, you cannot do this, um, then it may be that the, a new administration will be much more, much more forceful. So, but let, let's face it, I mean, what David said is also very correct. That is to say that in the larger scheme of things, Turkey is a NATO ally, is an important country, and you know your interests are uh, America's interests are very much in maintaining a, a good relationship, and that's what allowed Erdogan in the last few years to take advantage of this. So it will be, I think, it will be a mix. But the the big question, I, I would say, the big unknown here is how far will the Turks go in terms of intervening in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Aegean, because that also involves the European Union, and that is a, a potentially game changer. Can I quickly just add some, just a couple of sentences? Um, yes, Giran, yeah, please, please. Just about uh, what Dr. Pollock was alluding to earlier as well, and previously said at the National Press Club as well, between uh, choosing between uh, the Kurds and Turkey. Um, I think I, I define one of my primary roles in DC is to try and convince the US government to actually opt for Turkey, but opt for it properly, um, and to actually, choose a Turkey or invest in a Turkey, a more prosperous Turkey, a more democratic Turkey, a Turkey that will actually try and solve its Kurdish issue. And I think that the US needs to, um, or I try to urge the US to use its diplomatic channels to push this through because what we've seen, especially in the last few years, a more authoritarian Turkey is a less reliable Turkey for the US. A more anti-democratic Turkey is a Turkey that is willing to buy S-400s from Russia. So I think uh, one of my roles um, as both a Kurd and uh, the HDP representative in DC has been to try and convince the US government to actually work harder in trying to save its relationship with Turkey um, and on what grounds that needs to happen. Thank you. In your closing remarks, uh, uh, I'll give you one or two minutes. I know we have a hard stop, but I'll still a few more minutes. Uh, Dr. Karim. What could other Kurds do to support the Kurds of Turkey? And if you have anything else to add? Well, uh, first of all, I think uh, one of the biggest problems or obstacles the Kurds are facing is unity among the Kurds. And I, and I think that this unity has been exploited uh, to a great extent by uh, whether it's government of Iraq or Iran, Turkey, they, they all do, even Syria. Uh, so the, the, the most important thing is for the Kurds to resolve the differences, work together. It doesn't have to be open to, to, to be looked at as a threat to Turkey or towards any government. It could be done uh, quietly, agree on the main things. And regarding each part of Kurdistan's position and its special way of doing things, uh, that's one. Second, I believe, uh, the message we have to get to the people, Erdogan is modern day Mussolini and Saddam Hussein, really. Uh, Mussolini came to power through elections. He was even a journalist. Uh, and we saw what he did. Uh, with regard to, uh, you know, military attack and attack on civilians and everything, it's exactly what Saddam Hussein was doing. It's just a different way. It does have, it ha it does have a different name. And the last thing is, I believe that what Erdogan is trying to do is establish a 
Muslim Brotherhood control over the vast areas, of course, uh, in Turkey, he will be the person. He's doing it in Libya. He's doing it in Syria. He's supporting the jihadists who were part of the terrorist organizations, whether it was Al-Qaeda then became Al-Nusra or even ISIS. All the terrorist groups that came from Europe, from Central Asia, from North Africa to Syria, they all came through Turkey with their passport stamp. And the ones who wanted to go out and commit terrorist activities in Syria, in Belgium, in, other, in Spain, other places, all came out through Turkey and went back to those countries to commit those crimes. Thank you, Dr. Karim. Uh, Dr. Polak, would you add, please? Uh, first of all, again, my thanks to you, Yusuf and Najmadeen, and all of you for participating in this event. I found it very interesting and instructive. Um, there are some differences even among us, I think, on the panel. Um, but in general, I agree with the idea that certainly that intra-Kurdish unity would help the Kurds. There's no question about that. Um, to my mind, I, I still would say that that is unlikely to tip the balance toward um, a policy of antagonism or pressure on Turkey on this issue. Um, I do agree that a democratic Turkey would be a better ally, a more democratic Turkey would be a better ally for the United States, not just on Kurdish issues, but on a whole range of issues. And I think that it would be terrific if we could think of a way to help make that happen. But I'm having, a, a, honestly, a hard time trying to understand what exactly it is that the United States could do to, or would be willing to do in order to make that happen. I think that that is something that the Turkish people, Kurds and everybody in Turkey need to do for themselves and the, demographics and the polls and the long-term trend of history, I think, is likely someday, not any time in the next few years, as far as I could tell, but someday I think that will happen. And I think we will see a different kind of Turkish government and one that is more, not only uh, democratic, but also more open to real reconciliation with the 20% of its population that is Kurdish. And the only question that I would end with is, I'm not so sure that that will be a more pro-American Turkey. <laughs> and uh, that, that's a whole nother question, all right, for another seminar. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Polak. Uh, we, we appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Barki, please. Well, I mean, a lot has been said. I, sure, a democratic Turkey would be a much better Turkey, just not for the Kurds only, but also for everybody else in, in, in Turkey. And um, look, Turkey's democratic past has been really checkered. I mean, it has really never been a full democracy. It was um, very much under the military tutelage until, uh, until recently. The military got defeated by Erdogan, but he has replaced the military tutelage by some other structure uh, uh, that we can spend much time to, uh, defining it. So it will take time for Turkish democracy to, to, to establish itself. I mean, there's been a lot of damage done in a different way by Erdogan to the political uh, subculture, if you want, uh, of, of Turkey. And as I said earlier, I mean, Erdogan is not going to be there forever. Um, and in fact, when you look at his party, there is nobody who can actually replace him. So there's a, there will be a natural tendency, essentially, for some other leaders to emerge. And those two leaders will not necessarily come from the AKP. It remains to be seen. But, I, but it's very difficult to make any kind of projections. The only thing we can say for sure is that, as I said earlier, that the Kurdish movement is here to stay. And, uh, and just to add one more thing to what Giran said, 
it is in a much better position, not only to, uh, to maintain its position in, in Turkey, but also internationally. Uh, today, there's a great deal more talk about the Kurds internationally. There's a recognition um, of the Kurdish movement internationally. Uh, Syria, in that sense, has helped. And that is not going to be uh, forgotten that easily. Thank you. And thanks for the Washington Kurdish Institute for organizing this panel. It was really a lot Thank of you, fun. Dr. Barty. I know, I know we promised you we will finish at noon, but we know that we, you're behind that, but <laughs> forgive us for that. We'll give uh, one or two minutes to Giran. Very quickly then. Um, yes, we're talking about the prospects of the Kurdish movement. Um, especially in Turkey, but uh, as I mentioned in my earlier presentation as well, I think more and more we're going to be talking about the prospects of the Turkish state as well. Uh, Dr. Pollock uh, mentioned the activist outreach uh, into the region. Um, I think one of the uh, reasons why the Turkish state was not a very activist uh, foreign policy actor in the region before was because the, for the Turkish elite previously knew what kind of a glass house it was actually living in. And so it didn't want to throw a lot of stones before. But right now it is, and I think increasingly in places like Libya, in places like Syria, we're going to be talking about the Turkish state's prospects at the Aegean as well, the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, I think when we do talk about all of these, then we as the Kurds need to unite, as Dr. Uh, Karim said, uh, at unite and become a, a political actor in the region uh, that, that promises stability um, and harmony between all the peoples that are, that are living in the region. I think the Kurds until now have uh, shown that they can be that, uh, especially in Syria most recently too. Once again, we're, we're thank you all of you, distinguished speakers and attendees. Uh, we're honored to have you and we hope you'll join us in the future. This has been very uh, useful. And this event will be also on YouTube shortly. Uh, follow us at WDC Kurt on Twitter and we, we will see you on the next event. Thank you again and we will conclude from here. Thank you.